What role do local business improvement areas have to play in building communities? I'm here today with Lou Rose Merketer, who is Executive Director of the Young and St. Clair BIA, and we're going to talk about how to sustain economic centers locally. Hi, Lou Rose. Hello. I am really excited to talk to you today because you are full of innovation. Everything that you have done has just one upped everything else. So let, bring it on, right? Because you are about improving everything. Yes, that's a good way to frame it. So let's start off because we're going to talk about the importance and value of business improvement association areas. Yep. Um, but that, that pathway of how you got there, can you share a little bit about, you know, high level pieces about yourself? Mm, okay. So I guess I'll start from the beginning, how I got my name. Yeah. It's yeah. My, Lou Rose. <laughs> it's, it's my parents' name, but together. So my dad's name's Louie. My mom's name is Rosa. You put the two together, you get Lou Rose. So it's a Filipino tradition to combine your names or grandparents' names together. So I was born in Manila um, in the Philippines, and I first landed in Toronto in Thorncliffe Park, so not too far away from okay. here. Um, so started off there, like a lot of immigrant families, and then from there we moved to Mississauga. Uh, and had an incredible upbringing there, um, you know, sort of middle class family going swimming lessons, local yeah. schools and stuff like that. Um, my family was never political. I actually thought I was adopted because nobody else was passionate about sort of, you know, um, government and politics and what's going on in the world, um, except for my late grandmother, who really instilled, you know, being that that this thing about giving back. And ensuring that we always leave things in a better place uh, than we first found it. Um, so she really instilled in that sort of core value in me. And sort of my sort of path in terms of my career, you know, um, I got involved very on in high school in terms of um, sort of working within the city of Mississauga and volunteering on different city committees and boards and commissions. Um, and that sprung into my role working in sort of local government. Um, and, you know, I worked in the provincial government at one point around communications and community engagements is where I really, you know, focused mm -hmm. on. Um, and that spun around to like really great sort of opportunities working at one point I worked at Civic Action, working on a youth employment strategy for the, the region to the, one of the most exciting projects I've ever worked on is um, Sidewalk Labs. Uh, I worked at Waterfront Toronto and I headed up communications and public engagement for that incredibly exciting right. proposal for the city of Toronto um, to where I am now, where I'm working um, in sort of economic developments through the business improvement areas within the city of Toronto. So I first started in Little Jamaica on Eglinton West, and we could talk about we all the developments will. happening there. And, uh, and so recently, in this past year, I became the executive director of Young and St. Clair, which is one of the newest BIAs within the city of Toronto. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, a part of why I wanted to talk to you about local business improvement areas is because a lot of local businesses mm. don't even know what a BIA is. Yep. And so that's number one, because BIAs help support their growth. Yep. Number two, BIAs create community hubs in yeah. a way that give back to the community and make it feel vibrant and, and make it feel like, oh, this is an exciting place, yeah. which will in turn connect with yeah. why do people want to live there? Yeah. Right. And a lot of people for me as a realtor, mm. people will ask me, oh, what do you think about this community? And I'm like, Toronto is amazing. GTA is amazing. Every community is great. You help make it better. Well, thank you. <laughs> Uh, we're a small and mighty team across the city of Toronto. Yeah. We have 84 business improvement areas or BIAs within the city of Toronto. Um, Young and St. Clair is one of the newest ones we, we just established in 2018. And then the newest one in the city of Toronto, and it's surprising that this neighborhood never had it, is actually North York, North York City Centre. So that's it was, so surprising. that's right. So it was called Willowdale and now they just rebranded to Young North York. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I believe the last statistics I saw is that we represent within our 84 business districts, uh, over 50,000 small businesses wow, across the city of Toronto, which is, you know, you know, an incredible reach that we have. 
Um, and then an interesting fact, and I keep celebrating this around the world, basically, is that the very first BIA started here in the city of Toronto in 1970 in Bloor West Village. And this idea and this innovation has grown. And now there's BIAs across the globe wow. in almost ma- every single major city. Uh, in the United States, they call them business um, business improvement districts or bids. Um, and we could talk about sort of, you know, where we're going um, and how we spread sort of this innovation across the world. But just going back home here, the, the impact that we have in terms of shaping local community, supporting small businesses, creating that identity and attracting people to our neighborhoods across the city is yeah. just profound. No, it is. I mean, the fact that Toronto was the first BIA mm-hmm. in the world yeah. is powerful, right? And I want to talk more about it. I, as a someone who lives in Toronto, am really invested in, in seeing us thrive, seeing us grow and, and to see everybody, you know, achieve what they want. Um, and so can we start a little bit about how a BIA works? You sure. know, like local businesses who don't know about it, find out about it soon. How do they benefit? How does a BIA operate? Right. Yeah. Good question. Um, so we're an agency of the city of Toronto. So city council needs to approve a new BIA being developed within a particular neighborhood, but it starts with the local businesses, the property owners, the small businesses in a particular neighborhood who come together and decide and actually vote to create the BIA. So it's a very grassroots movement right from the get go. Um, and then once I had established or approved by the city, <clears throat> um, you have sort of a, an elected board from that membership within that district. So again, it's um, it, it's everything that's being decided in that neighborhood is 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 democratic because it's those who are actually living and working in the neighborhood that will decide where the funds are being distributed and spent on. Um, so once it's established, the annual budget of a BIA, they impose a levy on every square footage of commercial space within the district. Um, And so, you know, the larger the district, the more funds we have for the BIAs. Uh, Most of the BIAs in the city of Toronto are really small. Um, My BIA at Young and St. Clair, I think is number 10 in terms of the list of the city. Um, And so like our budget's about like a million dollars a year. And the great thing about being able to have that money is that you could invest that uh, specifically into the neighborhood. So we invest things on such as branding and marketing and um, marketing support for small businesses to like special events, um, you know, activations, um, campaigns to even um, streetscape improvements. So like we're talking about new pavers, benches, you know, new lights, banner poles, things that actually, you know, created an identity for a neighborhood. Um, Some are really large. Like if you go to Yorkville, you can see that there's really fancy pavers (laughs) that are along Bloor Street. And so that was a that was a a partnership with the BIA in the city of Toronto to create sort of that special district or down in the waterfront. um, Another sort of one of the bigger BIAs in the city of Toronto. That's really valuable, right? Because sometimes I hear people say, oh, why are the sidewalks so dirty? Mm. Right. And and in fact, some parts of Toronto, like the BIAs, right. will spray it. That's right. And that's where the money goes. Like something as simple as that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And so like even at Young and St. Clair, we have a dedicated team five days a week that's out there cleaning the sidewalks, taking down illegal posters, scraping them off of the sidewalk. Um, but if you imagine if we weren't there, it would be up to just the city of Toronto staff and the departments to take care of this space. Right. Um, so to have that additional sort of um, layer to help keep the community clean and safe and beautiful. Yeah. I think that's what helps strengthens our neighborhoods and our local local business districts. I think that's really valuable because I think a lot of people did wouldn't mm-hmm. have known that, right? Can we, we, you talked a little bit about how it comes from commercial square footage. How does the funding happen? Yeah. Just explain that a little bit. That's right. So um, every single year, the BIA board and its committees come together and they decide just sort of what the priority projects are of for the neighborhood or the services that are going to be rendered by the BIA. So they create that budget. <clears throat> and then they look at, OK, so if we're going to um, put a levy um, onto our members, how much is it going to cost to be able to raise this revenue? So every sort of square feet of commercial space and office space within the district 
will pay a certain levy amount that's set by a BIA board. Uh, so it's different from across the city of Toronto. Okay. Um, and then again, the city of Toronto collects all of that on behalf of the BIA and then sort of transfers the fund back to it. And that's the funds that are used to be, paid, be able to pay for the services, the projects that are happening there. Um, it's been really tough during the pandemic because we know a lot of property owners and small businesses were really struggling. So yeah. a lot of the BIAs try to hold the line at sort of 0% increases. Okay. But things and inflation costs. And but the great thing about the BI is that, you know, again, that's sort of the accountability, uh, be able to hold the, the BI accountable where your sort of funds are going every single year. And you see the noticeable difference outside of your your window, basically, totally as a show, the show, you know, as a shop owner and the services are being rendered. Um, and so even for my BI right now, we're going through a new strategic plan. And so we're asking our members, what are sort of the next priorities over the next five years uh, and what you would like to see within this neighborhood? Um, and so, yeah, it's very democratic, I would say. No, yeah. I love I love that it's super grassroots because mm -hmm. when you think about businesses, I think people forget the fact that people want to attract people into the area. Right. People want to have a positive reputation because it's all about brands and That's marketing right. and a small business is so bus busy thinking about how do I, how do I get yeah. my, my marketing and, yeah. or how do I just keep the lights on That's right. that they don't necessarily have the capacity to take out an ad or to yeah. do something sustainable. So this is where the value of a BIA Absolutely. is, right? Now I wanted to, you know, thank you so much for sharing about the BIA piece. What I wanted to also kind of talk about is the, how we we create and sustain a viable economic hub, mm. right? And we and and all the layers. It's not just like working with the local businesses, but the partnerships with the city. And I think you used to work for Little Jamaica. That's right. So I know that's a bit of a messy <laughs> topic because when we think about Metro Links and right. Little Jamaica was impacted the most, I would say, because yep. creating this LRT line that was supposed to take That's right. a few years evolved into a decade. That's right. How do we not repeat that? Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? So let, can we jump into that? For sure. Um, you know, yes. Yeah, so uh, Little Jamaica. So if, for those who, who don't know where it is in terms of the city, it's sort of that on Eglinton West from Allen Road to about uh, Dufferin. Um, and so I was privileged to be the manager of that BIA and was called York Eglinton for, for two years in the heart of the pandemic. Also the time when the province said that they're not going to meet their sort of opening deadline of 2022. Now we're going to 2024 and it's not open yet. Um, and it was just devastating to hear that, uh, as a local community, because you have, so you see this light at the end of the tunnel and suddenly, nope, it's not happening. And then to actually see it on the ground, to see these small businesses behind sort of ugly construction hoarding. Like I'm, I'm so surprised that they're still there. And that's because they had sort of um, a, um, a very sort of dedicated base of customers who would still go and, you know, get their patty there or get their haircut there or get their yeah. services because they want to support those businesses. Um, so now we, we look at, you know, across the city of Toronto and, you know, the massive, even larger projects compared to what we're doing across town on Eglinton, the Ontario line, I think is going to go through like a whole bunch of neighborhoods that are going to be disrupted over the next couple of years. Um, and out of, um, Scarborough and then even where I live in Mississauga, you know, we're, we're building a new LRT line as well too. So we really got to take stock and look back on what went wrong with this massive project. Um, and for me, uh, the way that I sort of sort of thought about this is like, OK, we're not the only big city in the world that has faced this issue. Yep. Right. And so I combed in terms of where can we find examples of other successful cities doing this? And the two that I found was in Montreal, not too far away. Yeah. You know, right. Uh, where the city of, uh, of Montreal actually gave um a rebate back to small businesses that were impacted by major construction in the city. And they did that by looking at their assessment from the pre, uh, previous years. Um, and they were able to apply up to $25,000 to receive directly from the city um, um, to actually get some funds back to invest back into the businesses to sort of offset the, okay. the impact of construction. So in that case, it was sort of the municipal government offering this, this program. 
Um, and then the other program was in the city of Sydney, Australia. Okay. Same thing. They were trying to create a new LRT line down the middle of the street, basically. They actually launched a public inquiry of how not to uh, do a massive construction program. And um, in that case, they they ordered the state government or this, this case, the provincial government to pay um yeah, to pay um, business owners sort of a fee for all the 10 years of construction mess that was happening. So they, they, they actually directed the government to to yeah. reimburse the, the small business owners on that main street for the construction. Something similar needs to happen into Toronto for what happened on Eglinton West. But also moving forward with these new projects, a program we actually support small businesses and to actually help them recover from their losses is due to construction. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally think so because when people hear business, they think that it's just thriving and making tons of money. Yeah. The reality that I know, yeah. local businesses are, they don't have the necessary purchase power of big corporations. Right. Right. Um, they rely on local people walking by yeah. and, and making the conscious decision. Like during COVID, it was always support local. Yep. Yeah. Shop local. Shop local. Right? right. And and that I think helps sustain a lot of different communities, um, local shops. So right. I just I just really want to emphasize that I think it is very important for us to be cognizant that small businesses are small. That's right. And their margins are not always that great. That's right. So, you know, supporting them is really important. Um, what are lessons? Having had the privilege of kind of seeing what happened in little Jamaica, mm. knowing we've got an Ontario line going through multiple communities, being where you are right now, like from your perspective, what are learnings that we can take away so we don't, so that, you know, the communities which may see disruption because of transit construction or what have you, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I think the government has already started to do that, you know, just based on the experience from, from the crosstown. So I know within the city of Toronto, um, even just funding the necessary staff to be able to support the small businesses are, are is now in place. So there's mm -hmm. like dedicated staff to support businesses and BIAs um, for the Ontario line, for example, right? Um, so that's that's great that they're doing that. The other big thing about you know, sort of shopping or, or, or supporting local to having those campaigns to ensure like even though the construction is happening, these business districts and these businesses are still there. Yeah. So we got to keep supporting them like people can't wait till, you know, five or 10 years afterwards to support them. Because they might not them be now. there. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, having those sort of um, campaigns and support and that messaging right from the get go is really important. So that's happening today uh, with new construction happening in the city. But I think the big piece that's missing is that sort of direct financial support and compensation for those businesses. If we're talking about a $10 billion transit project. And you can't tell me that we can't dedicate a few million dollars or a hundred yeah. million dollars to support small businesses yeah. as part of the overall budget for the project. Yeah. That's what needs to change moving forward. Um, and that's where the pressure from local businesses, uh, property owners, but also residents demanding that from our, from our government. Is it too late? Like, I'm thinking about how the Ontario line is, you know, scheduled to go from mm -hmm. the center of the city right. going up north, right? Yeah. Like there are plans already in place. Funds are allocated. Obviously, there have been delays and what have you. Right. Uh, is it too late? It may be too late, you know, for, for sort of little Jamaica or Eglinton West right now, but it's not too late for these new projects or the new ones that are being planned. Um, but this takes, this is going to take some sort of political leadership to be able to speak up on behalf of these businesses. And this is where sort of BIs come back into the picture, because if we weren't there, we weren't advocating yeah. and speaking on behalf of these small businesses. It's so hard as just an independent property owner or business owner to just speak by yourself, right? Yeah. So there are strength in numbers when we're talking about this. Um, and even my time, you know, as a manager of Eglinton, or sorry, York Eglinton and Little Jamaica, I created a national alliance of all the five BIAs that were heavily impacted awesome. by construction. And of course you did. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we were able to, you know, um, get a few million dollars for marketing support 
but also to ensure that um, the funding that we're receiving are for local priorities. You know, so the priority in Little Jamaica is not, you know, the same for somebody on the other side of the Allen Expressway and like, yeah. you know, so uh, I think being able to have those sort of dedicated funds to support those local priorities that local businesses and property owners want to focus on was really key. Um, so, yeah, so that's why it's important to vote. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, and I think this just is a democratic, like, a civic duty, That's right. right? And understanding it, I think underlying it, every guest who I have spoken with has always talked about how important it is get get the right leadership in. If you are, right. you know, like, get someone who represents you, represents your interests, understands where you're coming from, right. and just become curious, yeah. become engaged, right? And I mean, I'm similar to you. I I'm probably the the greatest political animal in my family. They're like, what? What are you doing? Why are you involved? And I'm like, well, if I don't say something, nothing's going to happen. That's right. Yes. Right? And, and so I, I've seen how that makes a difference. And I was often one of the only few Asian, Chinese mm -hmm. women of color mm -hmm. at many tables. That's right. Right? And I'm like, whoa, nobody else is around. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. And, um, <laughs> And learning as you go, right? Because there are things where if you've never been at that seat, you don't know. And I think what you're saying here about, yeah, BIAs matter. If you're a local business and you don't have a BIA, this is how you, you, you come together. It's a grassroots organization. That's right. When people are so busy trying to keep their business afloat, mm -hmm. they don't have that capacity. But knowing that, you know, that there is power in determining how much the budget is helps, right. but it's actually a great investment because it will help build right. the reputation of the community, That's right. which increases value That's right. for residents, everybody. Yeah. Right? It's a win-win. It's a win-win. Yeah. But I think it comes back to what you just said, like talk to like advocacy, talk to local representatives. That's right get local people, leaders. Like a lot of people, when you hear the term leader, mm. I think people are like, I'm not a leader. I'm just a regular person, but it's ordinary people doing extraordinary things right. where all of a sudden like, <laughs> Oh, I, you know, like people put that label on, right. Yeah. They earn that. And I mean, you, that's, I kind of, when you say, Oh yeah, I created a, a coalition <laughs> of the five top thing. I'm not, I'm not surprised, you know? And I, I think that there's value. So I want to go back to, being one of the newer BIAs, yeah. what are some of the things that you are doing that is different? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, so I think the other great thing about BIA is that there is some friendly competition amongst everybody else, right? You want to yeah. be the best, you want to be number one, yeah. you know, in the city kind of thing. Um, and that's that and competition is healthy. And, and I think that's great. Um, but how did you know, I think when we really took stock within my neighbor neighborhood at Young and St. Clair is, you know, why are people going here? And then how can we attract new business visitors to the neighborhood? And it, in, especially in the heart of the pandemic, um, yeah. that was really hard. And so one way that I think people really enjoyed in a sort of a safe way during the, the, the pandemic was being able to do things outdoors. So, you know, in the city of Toronto, we had this cafe TO program where we had, you know, expanded patios within the city. Uh, at Young and St. Clair, we took that to sort of another level where, you know, we had limited sort of patio spaces for a restaurant. So we created our own patio. So we yeah. transformed um, a green pea parking lot into an outdoor patio um, for two years during the pandemic. Um, and we connected sort of a reservation system where you could sit in that patio and 10 local restaurants could actually, oh, you could order yeah. off of the, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, an iPad and it would be delivered to your picnic table outside. So that was a great example of us sort of um, using sort of an underutilized space during the pandemic and connecting that with local businesses and trying to support the local restaurants in the neighborhood. The other big thing that we're doubling down on is investing in sort of permanent public art, but also temporary public art, mm. you know, sort of that Instagram worthy moment that people really love and enjoy and that they want to share um, so we've, um, working with local developers in the neighborhood and, you know, building new murals, commissioning sort of world renowned artists to, to create new permanent public art in the neighborhood that's has cool. been really successful. Right. So that's really cool. It also creates that vibe and ambiance yeah. in the neighborhood, uh, and landmarks in the local neighborhood. 
Um, but also sort of a temporary sort of um, art um, exhibitions that we've been doing as well, too. So the two big one that we invested is something called the Tunnel of Glam. So <laughs> that it's actually coming back in February 2024, where it's sort of like an outdoor tunnel. Um, and it's sort of like these glittery um, sequins, I believe it's what it's called, right? So there's like 25,000 of these little oh, glittery wow. things that you can walk down a tunnel through. Can you touch it? Yeah, like you can touch it. Loves, my kid has those uh, sequin shirts where that's it. it's a heart and it flips one way and then you flip it the other. So, so that's exactly that. it. And so we build a whole tunnel of that. Um, I love it. So that's Tactile. coming back. Yep. So that's really fun. And then in the summertime, we have something called the colorway where we took recycled pool noodles and created rainbow arches. Oh my goodness. Um, cool. And so that, so that just happened this past summer. Um, and now there's 10,000 pool noodles sitting in a, in a storage <laughs> container in, in Scarborough until we bring it back out next year. But it's sort of thrilling and fun. And like, you know, when we were tracking on social media, how many people are actually taking videos and, right. um, you know, reels of this, like, it's like millions of impressions of people actually seeing this, wow. which is remarkable. Um, and then just also like other BIAs, you know, having sort of a signature and event and the reason what you're known for in the neighborhood yeah. in the city. So, you know, Greek town with the taste of Dan for yeah. right? is a, is a good sort of example where the local BIA organizes something. Um, we're trying to create sort of our own lineup of signature events mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. So the biggest one coming up is for the holiday season. We started last year, something called the Toronto gingerbread festival. So cool. over the top, gingerbread displays this year we're building a, a replica sort of life-size house that a kid could walk through what <laughs> where's it being baked <laughs> uh there's a whole workshop of, of uh, little elves making them right okay. now yes. um so yeah again you know sort of these fun ideas to drive people into the neighborhood and to shop with local and support local in the neighborhood um so that's sort of the sort of the plans that we have in the neighborhood but then also going back in terms of um investing in the local infrastructure of the neighborhood you know to create that vibe yeah. and feel um so we have a multi-year program where we're building new pavers into the sidewalk to make them you know really beautiful and really mm -hmm. standing out but also new benches and street banners and planter boxes to really create that cohesive look and feel for the neighborhood and this is a true public private partnership so yeah. we're doing this in conjunction with local businesses but also we have like a dozen new towers coming into the neighborhood so Ooh, that's a lot yes right? so working with local developers to prioritize where we're going to invest and improve the public realm in the neighborhood so yeah. the huge body of work happening there so they all agreed to sort of a, we have a master plan for the neighborhood yeah. um and so that's that's underway right now um but also the city was is really great in this they also help do sort of matching funds for for projects up to a certain amount every single year for each bia so oh, that's really good um, so that's that's a great partnership with the city of toronto Okay, so we've talked about how local businesses have the BIAs oh. as a as a way of creating advocacy, creating um, a voice. Yeah. Right. Can residents get involved? Like, how can they help inform that decision as well? Because the residents are the people who will be living there. They're not necessarily the local right. business. Mm. So, you know, if I was living in in your area, I'd be yeah. like, oh man, this is so cool. <laughs> I, I want to have a say in terms of, I want to share my ideas or something. Oh, right? absolutely. And I think, you know, obviously the primary um, um, audience for BIAs is the business owners and the property owners, but we're, we also know that it's the local residents that that work or sort of live there that yeah. really want to have a say in it. So yeah. I was just alluded to the fact that we're updating our strategic plan. Yeah, uh, We do have sort of a public portion of the strategic yeah. plan where where we're, we have a public survey, right. so members of the public can do that. Um, we also have a mailing list of anybody who could sign up for okay. the updates to the BIA. So we had 5,000 people wow. in my neighborhood alone. That So it's a really engaged community. Um, and the other great thing about Young and St. Clair is that there's a lot of residents associations. So they invite me to their annual general meetings. Okay. And so it's speaking to a packed room, talking about the priorities of the neighborhood to hear about what they would like to see and how they would like to contribute. Um, but they're also really great in terms of supporting sort of all the events and marketing initiatives within the 
the neighborhood and resharing sort of the content we have. Um, so there's there's numerous ways that people can really support um, and give feedback to the BIAs, right? Um, some more than others. Um, you know, a lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of BIAs are very small operations. Thankfully, the one I'm at, you know, is a little bit larger and has more staff and support mm-hmm. to be able to do these engagements. But they're always, they know that this is a partnership with the local community. So don't be afraid to reach out. Well, no, and I think that's wonderful. I mean, you are certainly inviting and, hmm. you know, I would love to reach out all, you know, and, and be like, hey, but but on, on a more serious note, like what you alluded to about resident associations, yeah. right? Those are really important. Like it's all the pieces, communities coming together as a group and connecting into a network that feeds into the bigger picture, right? So right. you are supporting more the, the local businesses and commercial resident associations represent mm-hmm. the, you know, the residents in the community, right. which feeds into the local school board trustee, which right. feeds into the municipal counselor, which Absolutely. then feeds into the member of provincial parliament and the member of parliament. Right. And I think this is a part of how the community can really lift itself up right and 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 say hey these are the things that matter but it's also about having the agency and the voice and a big part of why i was like oh i'm so excited to talk to you (laughs) because i know you're doing great things but it's also to raise awareness for how the regular person like myself Mm. can find out more right whether more about my community how to be engaged how to make a difference and it's like grassroots yeah it's like grassroots at the heart of it right Yeah, I I hear and feel you. Uh, And I think, you know, there are sort of these ways that you could get involved at the local level. Um, I will say maybe this is sort of, again, reflecting back on what other cities do. Yeah. And what I've seen in other cities, and um, I I think a good example of that is probably um, Edmonton and Calgary. And even I just came back from Chicago. Yeah. um, Where they have sort of resident councils. Mm. So if you think about it, the city of Toronto has 25 wards. Yeah. Um, in other cities, they would have sort of a community council for each specific ward. Yeah. That would decide sort of these sort of priority areas and to work with the different um, political leaders that are elected and different city departments to sort of coordinate that. And that's something missing within the city of Toronto right yeah, now. Yeah, totally. And I can see how people, uh, you know, can see this really intimidating to be able to advocate for things at City Hall. Like you have to go down to like a committee meeting. Now they do virtual meetings that you could do it from the comfort of your home. But to even yeah. navigate that. Yeah. Uh, and then even working within Little Jamaica. And I just saw how there was a huge um, gap in sort of services that the city was offering to this neighborhood compared to where I am now in Young and St. Clair. Yeah. Like it's the same taxpayer, but they're still getting, they're getting vastly different levels of service from the city. But how do people right? learn about that? Yes, absolutely. Like that's the thing. Yes. It's like, you know, a big part of what my focus is on is focusing on the equity piece. Mm-hmm. But how do you know what is equitable or not equitable yeah. if you don't talk to people and, and you, you know what I mean? You don't right. know what you don't know. And when you know, you're like, what do I do? So in the absence of the city creating these sort of more formalized channels to, mm-hmm. to engage with and the city, I think, is doing a better job outreaching right now. There's the budget coming up. Yeah. So I know city councilors are sort of engaging with local residents. Um, but like just looking back at Little Jamaica, that was the one thing that compared to where I am now is that there wasn't a, a re- residence association. Yeah. Right. Um, And so but then grassroots groups started to pop up and they started to sort of self-organize themselves. Yeah. They didn't need to call themselves a residence association. They called themselves something else. So there's something called like Black Futures of Eglinton. Yeah. Right. Um, And so um, so they were so local commuters are already organizing at the grassroots level. Yeah. Which is really exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like my Facebook group. I've got a Facebook group for like my street and then I expanded it to include like, oh, I'm like, oh, yeah, all my neighbors on this other street. I mean, I guess I we it. could evolve to a resident council. Right. Yeah. Of what's going to happen, right? As the Ontario line shoots up our street. Yes. So, but what do you think is the best way to organize these sort of res- residents organizations? Right. Um, so I think it's different for every neighborhood yeah. and where you're at. And so I think for anything that I do, you don't do it alone. Absolutely. Right. And so you got to build sort of like uh, a team that believes in the same thing that you're doing sort of this vision that you have for your neighborhood or for yeah. the city 
and you need to organize around that. Um, and so that take, that's the hardest part, I believe, is trying to connect and identify other people. Yeah. But once you bring people together and you, you have that vision, you know, it's really powerful in terms of what, what you could achieve, yeah. even as a small and mighty group. Um, and so I think that sort of that community organizing at that grassroots level, I think that's we need to see more of that. Right. And I think we need to hear about how other people have done it as well, too. Right. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, I knew, <laughs> I, I knew that I would not get away with this conversation without some great ideas from you. And it's like, OK, we need to have resident councils. That's right. Yeah. Right. Um, what else do you think we could do? I mean, networking like you are a master at connecting people. <laughs> right. And I think it's also your wonderful personality that you're not afraid to ask. You're not mm. afraid to talk to folks. But if you were to give advice, I mean, your mentorship program that mm. you did. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that's really important. Like I wouldn't be where I am without people taking me under their wing. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things that I talking about organizing at the grassroots level is, um, you know, I was really involved in the city and all these other initiatives, but I wasn't doing anything for my own community. So for the Filipino community in Toronto and the greater Toronto area. Um, and a report came out of York University a few years ago that identified why there was a sort of a huge unemployment rate amongst Filipino youth, specifically Filipino males. Mm. Um, and it identified that they weren't uh, completing high school and as a result, not going to post-secondary education, not going into advance, advancing in their careers, um, being streamlined into sort of um, sort of certain industries that Filipinos are known for. So healthcare and hospitality. Right. Okay. Right. Um, and it identified the reason why that was happening is because there was a lack of, lack of role models and social networks and also mentorship within our own community. And so looking at that report, um, you know, a lot of people emailed me saying, isn't this terrible? We should do something about it. I'm like, absolutely. And then it sat on a shelf for like five years until I kept talking or, or, or referring back to this report. And finally, somebody's like, well, why don't we do something about it? Um, so bringing together sort of friends of my in my network, yeah. talking about like, what can we do as a generation and as a, as a community for this? Right. So looking at the landscape, we finally very even though the Filipino population is really large uh, in the GTA, I believe it's like 300,000 Filipinos. Yeah, that's a lot. You know, reaching out to the local consulate, um, Filipino consulate, they're saying there's like 500 Filipino organizations, which is great. But we found that all of them, looking at all of them, nobody was focusing on sort of mentorship and leadership right. development within the community. So it's like, OK, so I, that that's the gap that's happening there that we identified. So we decided to do something about it. So we created this organization called Rise Tribe with this specific mandate to create those leadership and mentorship opportunities for young Filipinos. So I believe now we're in our sixth year um, and now like we've grown so much, like we have partnership with MLSC, the Toronto Raptors. Um, during the pandemic, we actually created um, um, internship programs with sort of like large organizations for specifically for Filipino youth. Yeah. And so to see the transformative impact that you have on a young person's life. Like even if it's right? just one. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Is, is remarkable. Uh, and so this is done without no money, no staff. It was just all volunteers running this, basically. Um, and so that sort of being able to give back to my local community has been really powerful and really uh, beautiful at the end of the day. But at the same time, I was mentioning we are, we're not reinventing the wheel on these things. Like we looked at other communities and yeah. saw what they did. And so can we replicate these models yeah. and, and bridge that gap within the community? Well, you're always the master of work smarter, not harder, yes, right? That's right. Like that's why, like, I mean, <laughs> like one of the general themes I find was speaking with so many change makers and people yeah. who are making positive differences is the collaborative spirit. That's right. And the ability to say, I've got a problem. Can anyone help me? Yeah. And it's not about recreating the wheel, it's about like let's bring people together and right. find a common pathway or common good. And I love that, right? And I, yeah. I feel it's such a privilege you know, for you to be here to share your experience and insight. And I think it is also um, for the people who will be watching going to be really like inspirational, yeah. you know? So I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask in terms of 
you are also the chair of Proud Politics. Mm, yes. So we talk about how important it is to have mentorship. We talk about how important it is to be connected and bring people to the table and thinking about outside of the box solutions, but also looking at other people who have done it. That's right. Talk about representation. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. That's huge. Um, so Proud Politics um, sort of was born out of my own sort of personal lived experience. Yeah. Um, so I ran for city council in Mississauga. Um, wasn't successful, but ran against an incumbent that's been there for a really long yeah. time, right? Um, and the question of sort of my sexuality, you know, never came up at the door, but it was something in the back of my head that I was like, yeah. would, could this become an issue? And if so, how do you deal with that at the end of the day? Yeah. Um, around the time I was running for the first time for city council, I found through the internet, people were messaging me that this other young Asian guy um, named Evan Lowe was elected mayor of his small town in California. Um, reached out to him over social media. You know, we have sort of the same sort of story. Um, and he connected me to this sort of organization in the United States called the Victory Fund. Um, and so I went down to their annual conference in Washington with some friends and saw sort of this network of LGBT plus in, um, um, uh, politicians and candidates from across the United States coming together and actually supporting each other okay. and having each other's back and getting sort of professional training and support for their campaigns. And again, you look at the gap, we're like, we need to replicate this model here in the, in Canada. Right. Um, and so we created the, the Canadian version, um, and we called it proud politics. Um, and I, I don't know how many years it's been, maybe it's like eight or nine years now, but again, no money, no staff, just volunteers. Yeah. Um, and every single provincial election or municipal election we're we're supporting, LGBT plus candidates and showcasing them and highlighting them. We've also in the past provided training and support for them as mm -hmm. well, too. Um, and it's been powerful. And so as a candidate running out there on the field, you, you feel like you're not alone then. Yeah. Right. That you have a community, you have support, you feel like somebody has your back and somebody's rooting for you. And I think that's been, again, really powerful uh, in terms of that engagement and that support for, for our future leaders. And then our other big thing is, you know, it's so easy. Uh, it's easier as a candidate who's out and proud in, yeah. let's say, downtown Toronto. Yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, Versus we're talking. Red Deer, Alberta. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And yeah. So, you know, to be able to reach out to them and to support them as well. And so just the feedback that we receive and, and actually now since, you know, the last couple of years, we've been really successful at electing officials in every single level of government and every single political party. Um, and that's been really powerful. And that's really important that we need to be at those tables. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, and I appreciate that, right? Because even when I ran, yeah. and I have to say, putting your name forward, I respect all people who do it. And yes. sometimes it's not always about winning, but about having your name on the ballot so that when people see the choices, right. they say, oh, wait, what? Yeah. I can, I have that opportunity. Right. It's about trying. Yep. Right. So I think. I appreciate Proud Politics. Proud Politics has always been very supportive and and it's great to see um, the results of that as it grows and it matures, right? And yes. people recognizing, creating the space where there was a gap. That's right. Um, okay, so I always love to end okay. on a quote. Okay. And so you shared with me your favorite quote, which I love, My which goodness. is, I sweat the small stuff. <laughs> So t talk to me about this because I try not to, but I, but I do. I sweat the small, small stuff too, but why is that your favorite? Yeah, I think, yeah, I know people tell you not to do that, but the small details matter all the time yeah. and anything that you do. So uh, every day at work, you know, from an email to even the work that I'm doing right now at the BIA, like people sweat the small stuff, like there's something broken yeah. at the street level like there's light is out this sidewalk is broken this garbage receptacle is not working yeah right um to um little details within even public policy like this one line would make a difference and yeah. how this is interpreted and, and implemented That's if so nobody's true. paying attention to this basically right um so, and so that so when i say that i think it's the details that we're talking about yeah. and, and and being able to focus on focus on that is really important to ensure 
that we get things done right. Oh, I, 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 no, I appreciate it. I know we're not supposed to always, but it's, it's for me, it's also a big telltale because how you approach life, mm. it's like, you can tell a person's character, not in their big actions, right. but in, in the, the way they right. carry themselves, the small things. Yes. Right. Um, and so that's why I'm like, pleases and thank yous are such a basic, right? Like, Absolutely. Good point. Um, yep. But I just really appreciate it. I know our city's better and in good hands with you at the, you know, leading the charge there. And so thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for checking out this episode. You want to make sure to like, subscribe and share so that you don't miss out on the next In Focus episode on topics that matter to you.